Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, we explore the impact of the Intel leak scandal rocking the Pentagon. Also, the Navy shows off five design concepts for its forthcoming museum in the nation's capital. We'll show you the contenders. Plus, instead of prosecuting violent crimes, the Army has frequently kicked suspects out of the force. We talk to the authors of our investigative report on what that means for the public. And actor Jake Gyllenhaal is out with a new movie about a U.S. soldier trying to save his interpreter from the Taliban. Reporter Sarah Sicard talks to him about the film. It's those stories and more in the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Andrea Scott. A member of the Massachusetts Air National Guard has been arrested and charged with unauthorized removal and retention of classified documents after a trove of intelligence files about the Ukraine war were leaked online. The FBI arrested Airman First Class Jack Tashira of the 102nd Intelligence Support Squadron. The Pentagon is feeling the shockwave from the leaks. We talked to Bureau Chief Megan Myers to discuss the implications of the recent events. The Department of Defense continues to actively address the incident involving the unauthorized disclosure of classified documents. As the secretary made clear in his statement last Thursday, DOD's highest priority is the defense of our nation and our national security. And the department is taking this breach seriously and continues to work around the clock to better understand the scope and scale of these leaks. The Pentagon's top intelligence people are doing a review of all of this sensitive classified material, who has access to it, updating any distribution list to make sure that everybody on them is in a need to know situation, and then perhaps coming out with some sort of new policies or procedures to deal with this sort of sensitive information. In keeping with our responsibility to safeguard classified information, we are also taking a close look at security protocols and procedures and assessing whether or not they need to be changed. Secretary Austin, I think, as you know, has already restricted access to classified information in the Department of Defense. And at the president's direction, he has tasked his team to conduct a thorough, comprehensive review of departmental security programs, policies, and procedures. Now they're still trying to get their arms around all of the documents and everything that's out there. Um, a lot of senior leaders are reaching out to their counterparts in other countries for other countries who are named in some of these documents, Ukraine, some countries in the Indo-Pacific, um, just to reassure them that they're, they're trying to stanch the leak as much as possible um, and to communicate with them about what information is now out there. He also directed senior leaders across the administration to reach out directly to allied and partner leaders to reassure them about our commitment to safeguarding intelligence, to answer to the best of our ability any questions that they might have, and to express our continued commitment to all our security partnerships. Day to day, it hasn't changed anything for service members. Um, you know, the, the rules around having a security clearance remain the same. The rules around posting on social media remain the same. The Pentagon has really tried to reiterate that this was a deliberate criminal act and not the result of any sort of misunderstanding. It's not likely that social media policies will change because already, you know, you're not supposed to be sharing your work online. The Pentagon over the last year put out a pretty strict social media policy for service members that you need to have a disclaimer in your bio that says that your views, you know, are not shared by the def Defense Department, um, that sort of thing. So there may be some um, awareness uh, materials that go out, but in terms of the rules, they're pretty tight as they are. 
So one of the things that the FBI and the Justice Department is trying to determine is how to Jack DeGera knew about these documents um, and when and how he accessed them. He was an IT guy. He worked on the network that housed these documents, but these documents were not something that, you know, came across his desk or his email as part of his regular course of work. Um, but he did have a security clearance to be able to see them in case he ran across them in the course of maintaining this network. So there will be some questions to answer about how he found out about them um, and how he knew where to get them, since it's unlikely that they were actually sent to him. This case sort of really does crystallize the outsized effect that one person can have on the DOD when they have anti-government views, when they are online, um, you know, talking with their friends, posting racist memes, talking about white supremacy. Um, none of those things look good for the Defense Department. And then on top of it, you have someone who has this high level security clearance and is able to leak these documents seemingly for the entertainment of his friends. The next thing we'll see in this case very well may be more charges from DOJ, another affidavit with more details of how uh, Tajera may have been able to carry out this leak, uh, because right now they, they charged him based on some very specific minor details based on talking to some of his friends from Discord. So that's probably what we're going to see next is a, a broader narrative and maybe more even um, criminal implications for what has happened. From the Pentagon, I'm Megan Myers. In other news from around the military, the Navy has unveiled five design options for the service's new National Museum, which is slated to open in 2025. All five design ideas include a ceremonial courtyard and plans to accommodate Navy artifacts, including a Corsair aircraft, a swift boat, and the sail of a submarine. The new museum will be built outside a gate of the Navy Yard in Washington, D.C. And a new report from the Navy sheds light on a near miss between two vessels in San Diego Bay late last year. A preliminary investigation obtained by Navy Times says that communication issues and a failure to maintain a proper watch resulted in the guided missile destroyer Momsen and dock landing ship Harper's Ferry passing on the wrong side in close vicinity to one another. Neither ship was damaged and no one was hurt in the pass. The report noted a number of protocol breaches in the near miss, which took place in November of 2022. When we return, reporter Jonathan Lairfeld leads a discussion with reporters investigating the Army's criminal justice system. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Jonathan Lairfeld from Military Times. Today, we discuss a recent story between Army Times, ProPublica, and the Texas Tribune. An extensive review of Army criminal cases involving violent crimes discovered that the service is increasingly discharging soldiers in lieu of prosecuting some sexual assault cases. I spoke with Army Times' Davis Winky and two of the folks he worked with from ProPublica Viana Davila and Lexi Churchill about their work on this piece. Well, Davis, would you mind giving us a 30 second premise of, of your story? Yeah, this was a first of its kind data analysis of army court martial records dating back decades that allowed us to reveal for the first time that the army is increasingly using administrative separations or just discharges in lieu of taking people charged with violent crimes to court martial. It's a concerning trend, and it's one that we tried to dig into as part of this story. Excellent, thank you. Well, I'd love to ask maybe you, Lexi, sort of where this idea came from and why you specifically focused on the Army. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so the idea started with our data reporter on the project, Ren Larson, who is absolutely wonderful and was very observant and uh, noticed as we as she was parsing through the Army Courts Martial database that we have, which shows cases, as Davis suggested, going back to 1989 that reached arraignment, that there was this weird outcome for a lot of the cases that she kept seeing called administrative separation in lieu of trial. 
and she just kept noticing it and it kept coming up enough that she was like, hmm, we need to look into that a little bit more. And once we sort of figured out what it entailed was, which is essentially that, uh, as Davis said, folks are leaving that have already been charged and in some cases are pretty far down the line towards going to trial for these violent crimes. Um, and they, they simply leave with, with another than honorable discharge. Um, we thought that that was definitely worth a greater look. Davis, I'll jump back to you. I'm hoping we can break down the basics of what you touch on in your story, which is the different perspectives as to why there are soldiers that are being released on administrative leave as opposed to going through this court-martial process. What, why do you see um, there are those that are in favor of that versus continuing each or any of these cases through trial? From the accused perspective, if you are about to get rung up and become a felon and have a federal criminal record or, you know, face lengthy confinement or something like that, these discharges are really appealing. If the main trade-off is that you receive an other than honorable discharge and lose access to certain VA benefits, that's a rather small price to pay if you think you're at serious risk of doing hard time for something. And on the other side of this coin, you've got prosecutors who in some cases may realize as they're getting closer to trial that a case isn't as strong as they thought it was. Or maybe a judge rules that certain evidence is inadmissible. Or maybe you just find things that the investigators miss. There have been systemic problems with the Army's Criminal Investigation Division in, re in recent years that sparked major reforms. You know, for prosecutors, this is a way to, if a case might not win at trial, get this person out of your formation with a bad paper discharge. And so they see it as a way to ensure good order and discipline within the ranks. But on the other hand, there's no public record after these separations happen, other than, you know, limited access databases and things that can be reached via background checks. You just don't know whether somebody has been discharged in this manner and what charges led to that discharge unless you know exactly where to look. And in the course of our reporting, we found people who were very close to individuals who were discharged in lieu of court-martial who had no idea why it had happened. Now, I wanna, as we wrap up, ask each of you what surprised you the most about this reporting and also what some of the key takeaways are for our listeners, for your readers, uh, that they should be of course, leaving from a story like this. So, Viana, I'll jump to you first. It's surprising to learn, as someone who has not had sort of personal experience with the military, how complicated the military justice system is. And even though it shares many characteristics with the civilian system, there are, are so many different avenues a case can go um, that never even make it to, to charging, that never make it to court, and that it is so hidden from public view that that that's concerning because citizens who may not be in the military can still be affected by the military justice system as we see time and time again. And so that, you know, is, is always sort of um, sobering to learn. Lexi, the same, same question to you. What, what surprised you the most? And also what are some key takeaways you think listeners and, and readers should, should have? In the military, unless someone is convicted, you cannot get their court records which is so different from how it works in the civilian system, where once a case starts, you are typically able to get records as they go. But unless a case is you know, being covered very heavily or is of public interest, there's few exceptions, you will not be able to get court records in a case that is ongoing and a case that is discharged in this way or dismissed or that someone is acquitted. And that is so jarring because so many of the legal experts that we've spoken to have said cases that end this way, cases that someone is acquitted, can be just as valuable to see how the military justice system works and what the steps were that led to that. Now, Davis, over to you. Anything that surprised you and, and some key takeaways? For me, the most surprising thing was the least surprising thing about it, which was just how 
much everyone affiliated with the military who we spoke with for this story just accepted this as the way that it is. And we're saying, you know, yes, yeah, sure, the GAO said 50 years ago, 50 plus years ago, that these need to be eliminated, but they're here now and they're used and they serve a purpose and they help, uh, you know, help us keep from being overwhelmed by cases. They help keep us from losing bad cases and having to send, you know, people who were charged with bad things back into our formations. It was a fascinating case study to me in the law of unintended consequences, where you cannot predict the way that a tool is going to evolve to be used over time based on the changing needs and composition of the military, of the JAG Corps, and of the military justice system. And it's this kind of bureaucratic inertness that is what led the military justice system to become so mired in its own blind spots in the manner that lawmakers argue necessitated the ongoing reforms that we see. Thank you all very much for making time for this. An incredibly interesting story. I hope our listeners and viewers take a lot away from this. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. You can listen to this conversation in full in the Early Bird Brief podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Stay tuned for more Defense News Weekly. When we return, our personal finance expert gives you tips on managing your finances. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives you her latest tips. A positive credit history provides lasting benefits for your personal finances. Having and keeping healthy credit makes it easier and cheaper for you to borrow money. But you may be wondering, what happens if you don't have very much credit or none at all? Good credit isn't built overnight, but you can start now on some easy habits that'll get you on the road to credit success. One of the most important ways to build credit is to always pay your bill on time. That's what gives you credibility with lenders. So once you get a loan or credit card, it's best to set up reminders or use auto pay to keep those payments timely. Also, you should keep your loan balances low. Try not to exceed 30% of your available credit. This shows you're credit worthy. And while it's good to have different types of credit on your report, be careful you don't have too many. Having lots of credit cards or loans or frequently applying for credit can negatively affect your score. Keep track of these things on your credit report and your score at least yearly, and do help yourself by creating a budget and sticking to it. You always have to know where your money's going to successfully manage your cash flow and your debt. Once you become a credit card holder or take out a loan, you're the master of your credit destiny. But no worries. These tips will help you win at your financial life. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more coverage of military and defense topics, steer your destroyer toward Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com, as well as DefenseNews.com and C4ISRNet. StayWithMeNow.com. And to be the most up-to-date airman on the flight line, sign up for our early bird brief for stories sent to your inbox. It's also an audio. Check out the podcast version out each weekday. And if social media is where you get your headlines, follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We'll be right back after a quick break. When we return, we talk to actor Jake Gyllenhaal on his new movie about a soldier trying to save his interpreter from the Taliban. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. In his new movie, actor Jake Gyllenhaal portrays a U.S. soldier who heads back into the field to save his former interpreter from the Taliban. The A-lister talked to Military Times' Sarah Sicard recently about the movie and about the role. Here's part of their conversation. Just wanted to start by asking, you know, what initially drew you to these characters? I mean, it was an easy, easy, um, how can you say no to, to Guy Ritchie and working with Jake Gyllenhaal? So, so it was an, I would have you know, done any work with these guys. But then on top of that, as a bonus, you get to do um, a very special movie about a very important topic. 
and, and done in, a, in an unsentimental way about, you know, these heroes that we have on the ground in, in Afghanistan and in Iraq um, from both sides with, you know, unlikely friendships, to get two guys from different cultures uh, who choose to do the right thing. It's an, it's an honorable story. Uh, it's an important story. And uh, so I was drawn to it, like, on all levels. Yeah, I mean, I would say I... I've wanted to work with Guy. I've known Guy for many years now. I've always wanted to work with him. And um, when he brought this story, I was surprised because it's unlike a Guy Ritchie movie that we're, we've come to know, you know. Um, but I was so moved because it didn't feel political to me. It felt a, it was about, it was a parable. It was a, an action movie, an action parable, we kind of like to say, you know, because it was about doing good reluctantly. I think selfless service is an idea that is really interesting because in the end it's about action it's not about saying to yourself oh how do i necessarily feel about this i love that there are two characters who don't like each other very much but they they do it out of a duty you know they do it out of the sense of goodness is inside of us you know and as americans i think we we are we are made of heroes this country and reluctant heroes a lot of times and that's the fabric of who we are and it's what the movie felt to me and it made me proud when I read it and then now watching it, it makes me proud to be an American. You still don't remember a thing? I don't remember any of it. I only remember the interpreter. Did you guys get the chance to work with any military service members or interpreters in particular in the filming of the movie? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, in the preparation, uh, I spoke to a lot of veterans back home and interpreters. And, and uh, also on set, we had uh, some very some very skilled uh, special up guys, adv advisors who worked mostly with Jake because he had to be the one doing those things right. And uh, we had an Afghani interpreter on set as well. Yeah, I mean, my... My good friend is a Marine, and he, you know, fought in Fallujah, many other places. His interpreter, he will say, because he's told me I can't say it, he owes his life to him. He brought his interpreter's daughters over to the States, and, you know, my friend is now the head of emergency services in New York City, and his daughters are devoted to, you know, the city of New York as a result of, you know, his connection to them and what they've done. And I think, you know, um, you know, I think that there is... Um, there are like it's a history for me of I've made a number of movies at this point where I've either played someone in the military or has had military background and the advisors have changed my life it's now been over a decade since I made this movie Jarhead but since then I made a movie called End of Watch where I played ex-military and have had some of the most incredible technical advisors uh, around showing me what to do and, uh, and on this one, we had the same. Uh, two incredible special ops guys, uh, big hearts, super humble, good dudes who just, they're in the movie too. They both act in the movie. Not bad actors either. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, they were with us all the time. And I was updating, you know, my tactical, my weapons handling, all that stuff was updated by them. You know, they'd be like, ah, we did that five years ago. We don't do that anymore. Um, and it was great. It was really great fun. And they truly, what they did was bring all of us together, mm -hmm. particularly as a unit, all those guys bringing, you know, six, eight actors together to try and do this. They were the heart of making us a team. And, um, that was, that was really what we learned. And that's what I've learned from most of the military advisors that I've worked with outside of all the details. It's been that. It's been we're together, we're a team, we're devoted to each other. And it just makes movie making so much better. Fantastic. Thank you guys uh, so much for taking the time to chat with us. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.